Hi, this is Brennan Ferguson, a designer and writer. And Dave Grossman, lead designer slash writer. And Dave Bogan, art director. And Kim Lyons, environment artist. And Emily Morganti, marketing. So here we have the mole, the mom, and the meatball. And it's purple. It's purple. Hey. And it's, more importantly, it's not yellow. <laughs> yes, we had originally planned to go through the colors of the rainbow on the six opening sequences, but we got as far as orange, and people started posting on the forums saying, hey, what's the next uh, color going to be? And they started associating the rainbows with Hugh Bliss, which was exactly what we didn't want them to do yet anyway. We wanted to sort of keep that a secret for a little while. So we, as an emergency last second measure, changed this one to purple. Yeah, even though it works uh, more nicely as a package for a full season to have each episode have a color of the rainbow and have that to tie in with Hugh Bliss, um, being forced to change midstream actually kind of opened up possibilities with a couple of the other episodes and that worked out really nice for us. Sam and Max never do anything in the right order anyway. <laughs> That's true. But he said to stop carving them into the suspects. He can't read them without his bifocals. Uh, so this episode we had uh, Jeff Lester again doing contract writing. Uh, and he wrote a lot of fantastically funny dialogue. The cutthroat killers with no respect for human life but an odd predilection for delightful children's toys? The same. I love those guys! Yeah, the line that's coming up about does the carpet match the drapes, the first time I played it, it was like, I can't believe they just said that. <laughs> and, uh, there's actually a point when Kevin was playing it for the first time right before it came out. You can kind of fast forward it through the beginning. Then he goes into Bosco's and dum 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 and he talks to Bosco's. Why did they just ask Bosco if the carpet matches the drapes? <laughs> I think in general this this Sam and Max series has been a little bit more edgier than probably any other game that I've worked on in terms of, you know, dialogue and and content. Not not speaking about violence or anything, but just the the writing. And it's uh, actually really refreshing. Um, usually larger studios will hold you back and, and not let you do certain things because they want to get that G rating or whatever it is. Yeah, right, writing for these, G you have for to kind of pretend that you're Steve Purcell and <clears throat> imagine what we, he would do and or say. And it's actually a fun E for place not your head. funny. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So uh, we've been really, really happy with what we've been able to do here. and. Uh, a couple of times the boundaries have been pushed and, and I was feeling a little nervous, but overall you you play back through it and it's all funny stuff and it's worth it. I'm glad we can uh, do that at Telltale. These uh, guys in the bear heads caused a, t a temporary rift between me and the sound guys. Because they all think they wanted to... Those sound they, guys! They wanted to uh, process the, the voices of the characters who were wearing the bear heads, which is basically everybody knew that you talked to, except for that one guy over there. Uh, so that they would sound like they were, yeah, muffled coming from in the middle of something. And it just sounded too muffled to be, to be pleasant, and even, the, even doing it just a little bit. So I didn't let them do it, and they... Um, hounded me about it for uh, the next three episodes. Nice. Just be glad you don't have to go into the voice recording sessions where it gets brought up every time I sit next to Julian. <laughs> <laughs> but really, we actually like each other. I don't want to give There's a nice little detail in there behind the uh, Wacker Wrap machine is a, a, a fresh flower ashtray with cigarette butts sticking out of it. And uh, again, it's very refreshing to, to have a game that you can have you know, someone smoking a cigarette or um, a dirty ashtray or a bottle of booze up on a shelf somewhere and not have someone standing over your neck, you know. Yeah, we just want to make games that look more like our offices, so. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. How'd you get them then? By cheating? Well, these environments, I think, were a little funner because I think on this episode, we started having more movable items in the episode. Like this one has the toy train, and I think in the factory had the movable arm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's right. Started kind of. And the balloons. And the balloons. Yes. That you don't see. Yeah, it took us to the third episode. episode. And Just the singing. Who could forget the singing bear heads on the wall? <laughs> what singing bear heads? Those hey, ones. <laughs> that's my favorite song, I think, from the from the series. That one. The war song gets a, a lot of press from the subsequent episode, but. Uh, because it's a major production, but the singing bear heads were the ones that made me the happiest. I think most of the fans like the song, the bear song, better than the war song, just lyric-wise. Wow, that's a hard one to beat, the war song for me. Yeah, it's pretty good. 
Uh, it's a weird phenomenon that happens. Um, every time Jared writes music for any of the games that we do, we, uh, we're constantly hearing people sing it or, or play it or have it on their ringtones on their phones. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, every time I hear Sam and Max's office music now, I think my phone's ringing. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, he's, uh, he's moved worlds, Jared, with his, with his tunes, which is nice. That guy Leonard there, by the way, is a, is a character from uh, Telltale Texas Hold'em, sort of repurposed. Right. He Boris. Played, uh, Boris Crinkle. Crinkle. Leonard State Charmer was actually my proposed uh, name for that character in Telltale Texas Hold'em, hmm. but Dan was uh, quite uh, in love with Boris Crinkle, so uh, I got my way in the end by just bringing him back <laughs> into this episode. Isn't there a line about it in Texas Hold'em? You yeah, like that, the there's a Charmer. line in Texas Hold'em's, a mirroring line in this one. This is a bug. Precisely. Does this thing really work? Does this thing really work? Uh, of all the voice actors, I think I'm probably partial to the voice of the bug here. <laughs> 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 know, it just brings something to the role that, that just makes me see all of humanity or bug entity or whatever it is for bugs. And what you're missing there is that that, that is Brendan. <laughs> yes, okay, fine. <laughs> that is me. Think you can handle it? It's very hard for me right now not to start going into the bug voice. Actually, that's one thing about the voice audition or the voice recording where as soon as I hear the other characters doing their voices, I want to imitate them for the whole rest of the day. So I go around talking like Hugh Bliss or Bosco all the time. <laughs> sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's scary. <laughs> it's always a little bit. <laughs> so this puzzle was originally going to be a lot more complicated. Actually, the puzzle with the bug at the door was originally going to be a lot more complicated. We just saw it sort of crawling up the wall to go be next to... Uh, the guy who was going to say the password, and originally the, the train that I think Kim mentioned a little while ago was wrapped up all in that puzzle. You, you had to um, give that guy at the door some pretzels so that he would order a drink and it would come on the drink train from the kitchen, and then you were going to take the bug and put it on the train, and it was just like this enormously elaborate thing that you had to do just to get the bug to be near him when it really just seemed like you ought to just be able to throw it. <laughs> Cut all that out. And that, uh, that decision kind of opened up this nice opportunity to have the bug crawling up all these different surfaces and basically forced us to do like a little mini cutscene for the bug for each character, which um, ended up being really cinematic, I think. Seeing the bug crawl up the wall and end up on Sybil's desk in front of Sybil with a nice low camera shot. Um, it was really cool looking. And also introduced our first uh, film wipe technique into the games. <laughs> Which is cool. Here's another example where we're always asking, oh, we'll just have a whole bank of monitors and you'll be able to see Sybil over the webcam and other environments and all this stuff. And somehow John Scrow and Dave Bogan managed to figure out how to do it. And I wiped my hands the whole matter. Uh, we like to add in a lot of uh, little background jokes and, and moments. In this scene, um, Chuckles is talking to the head honcho, and in the background you see Max eat the webcam that was in Sybil's. Uh, not everybody notices it, but when they do, uh, you're guaranteed a little laugh. I can't look away from it. It's, it's so distracting seeing his giant white head appear there. <laughs> 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 the guys are saying, cause... Steve you're supposed to be listening to the dialogue. That's Steve's <laughs> kid's one... favorite part. They play that over and over. Mm -hmm. They think it's hilarious. One of the... Uh... The other things that I that I really like about this episode in particular is that the characters around Sam and Max's neighborhood are really wrapped up in the in the puzzles that are going on. Like you're you're trying to get into the the toy mafia, and they have a bunch of tasks for you to do that actually directly involve your your neighbors. You're supposed to you're supposed to kill Sybil. You're supposed to deliver stuff to Bosco's store. So it made it feel all kind of homey and cohesive. Hi, jerkbag. Trying to rent something hot, Leonard. This was going to be a puzzle too. You, there was a um. A defeat Leonard while he's got the gun on you by navigating him over onto the loose board, and then you stomp on the loose board and knock him over. Cut, cut, cut. <laughs> <laughs> gotta, gotta cut some puzzles or the game some puzzles. Like an adventure game puzzle. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it sounds a little, a little too much like an adventure game puzzle, actually. Okay, Leonard, are you gonna tell us where the sand There's that rope that again. Rope? <laughs> That's a different rope. It's a different, different color. It's partially the time. same rope. Bigger. But we also have ankle ropes, <laughs> which chain him to the desk, and and uh, we were getting a little tired of the rope at this point, so we we needed some kind of uh, at least some kind of addition to it. I never get tired of the rope. <laughs> <laughs> it's versatile. We should just keep inventing rope for new body parts. It seemed like there was a lot more yo mama jokes in here before. Um, we may have cut down at some point. And uh, was, we cut down just a couple of the setups for them. Oh. But they're all funny. Funny, funny. Dan, Dan is always looking at stuff going on YouTube, and he's happy or excited when people post things from our games on YouTube. And, like, the day after this came out on GameTap, before, you know, most of our customers had even played it, um... There was a Yo Mama clip up on YouTube. It was a, that was a good day. Yo Mama. <laughs> it's a good day when you're on YouTube. Yes. <laughs> it's one, it seems like the things that I'm always the least sure about whether they're going to work are the things that get the best response from the fans. <laughs> that should tell me something. <laughs> well, actually, one uh, little technical hiccup that we work with sometimes is when we make dialogues, um, we, we have to structure them in such a way that uh, you know, it could it go on alternate paths. Like when Max, for example, gives his punchline for the Yo Mama joke, after that it's supposed to transition to either Leonard saying, what are you talking about, that makes no sense, or um, Leonard getting freaked out. But there's always a slight hitch uh, before that it can transition to that because it has to change the dialogue branch. And because of that, the timing of those scenes is, I can never get it to be exactly the way I want. I always wanted Leonard to start screaming instantly as soon as it... <laughs> you have done what we have asked of you. Acts of intelligence, malevolence, and some That's a lot of heads. <laughs> welcome you into the ranks of the Orso Nostra. My stuff running This is we cast the, uh, the character of uh, Don Teddy Bear slash Harry Mole Man based mainly on his ability to switch between the two voices that he has to do in, in mid line. <laughs> the two very different voices. <laughs> and then he doesn't. In the final version of the script, he doesn't actually even do that. Holy fat free carp on a skewer. You're a mole. In fact, you must be the one we... Does the carpet match the drapes? The code phrase, idiot. These guys are freelance police. I think Harry's my favorite voice that we've kind of run across so far. As, you know, next to the bug, of course. The bug. It's, it's interesting, there's a painting on the wall up to the left. Let me see if we can see it again here somewhere. It's a, it's a painting one of the environment artists did, and I think it's actually a guard tower of San Quentin. Yeah. I don't know if it ever made it into the game. Yeah, you can see it up there on the left. But it was really funny. That's another uh, one of these great moments of exposition where we just we just want to make it clear that you cannot shoot their tires. <laughs> right, we keep painting ourselves into corners because we uh, make a puzzle solution in one episode and then say, okay, well, we want to do something different now, but we don't have any good reason why we can't just keep doing the same thing forever. So we just make up lies. <laughs> as long as that is telegraphed to the player, though, they should be able to understand that right away and, right. you know, get so over it. That's our entire uh, cutscene. It's telegram. <laughs> I think uh, this is my favorite collaboration of music and environment together yet that I've seen in the game. Um, the score for this environment was actually time to go with all the, uh, or vice versa. The animation for the environment was time to go with the, the musical score for this environment. And it's just got a really great. Um, Kind of Raymond Scott feel. Uh, this character of Harry Mole Man here was actually one that uh, we had this idea that we wanted to have the, the mole be an actual mole and uh, once we had that drawing of Harry Mole Man up in uh, episode one uh, out by the child star thing we figured yeah he, he's the guy he's, he's the mole that we're looking for 
Uh, but then we realized after we had written the script that we never had a moment at which we declare that his name is Harry Molman. Yeah. We never really said that. And so there were actually a few references to Harry here and there that we had to edit out because they didn't make sense without that little bit of exposition. But fortunately, later in the series, we got the chance to finally find out his real name. This is uh, yeah, one of the greatest scenes in the whole season. <laughs> Very well written by Jeff Lester. I just love how this episode ends. The whole part from driving up till this, up through the end, is just so epic. <laughs> yeah, this is one. Uh, when we have, uh, when we finish the designs of the episode, we'll go over them with you know the leads of the team and talk about what's happening. This is one I enjoyed, even acting out what was going to happen as I staggered around <laughs> saying, "Max, in his last moments." Harry and Sam are getting kind of fed up with uh, Max here. And I think even Lauren, one of our animators who worked on this scene, was getting ready to strangle Max at the end of this cutscene. <laughs> I actually had a comment from someone in the press who wrote in to say, whoever did that last <sighs> Harry Molman, was good job. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we can make use of some good uh, cartoon, classic things, the gaze going up. Sometimes we actually do look for ways to just kind of iconically or quickly give you the idea of something without having to have a lot of boring exposition, like I'm doing right now, for example. Um, you know, just quick ways you can see, aha, pressure builds up in this thing. Good, good. Now I'm off to see what Ryan Ah, good old Fred Bassett. I don't think anybody even knows who Fred Bassett is. We all had to look that one up. <laughs> You keep playing dead. I'll figure out some way to bring Teddy Bear and his factory to their respective meetings. <laughs> I can't hear you. I'm dead. There goes nothing. Yeah, this is this is one of the parts that, for some reason, I was really stuck on. I said, no, Teddy Bear must get clogged in the works. That's just the way it has to end. <laughs> it's the fitting end. He's so fat. Pleasantly plump. <laughs> Oh, if, it, if it is just a big suit, one wonders why it doesn't just get out of it. Right now. <laughs> Not too bright. He's strapped in. On the art end, we uh, we try and make a conscious effort to um, make each environment unique, not only in what uh, what objects and scenery you're seeing, but the, the color palette for them as well. Mm -hmm. This is a good example of an environment that you'll see the base colors and the mood and the feel of this room feels different from any others. That's excellent. That's so Very great. Simple. That one scene cost us $25 million. <laughs> <laughs> no worth it. Actually, it was uh, probably about an hour of John Scrow's time. Breaking the bank and the sidewalk and the water main and the buffet table. You were really broken up about that buffet table, aren't you, Max? It was the only innocent in this whole affair. We always end on food somehow. Yeah. <laughs> and that wasn't on purpose? <laughs> I'm not saying it wasn't on purpose. Well, at, at the end of the day, when we're writing, we're all getting kind of hungry. So you just kind of gravitate towards the things that we want to eat, like weasel bars or whatever. I forget what he says right there. Mm -hmm. The other big hurdle for this entire last cutscene sequence was the fact that the toy factory was supposed to explode. Um, and that's something we tend to avoid in in uh, our short production schedules. Do not have factories explode. We're, we're pretty uh, light on effects, mm. and that uh, that ends that one, I guess. But we did it. 